Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful individuals. Welcome back to League Unlocked. Eric and Mark here with the Beauties Tour. Woo! A lot of action on the Rift today, both LCK and LPL. We were ready for a couple of speed runs through in the LCK matchups, but both BNK Fox and T1 had, uh, we'll say, different ideas on the Rift. Listen, losing a nail-biting game three to Hanwha Life that gets flipped on a single team fight. Hey, that's forgivable. Hanwha Life is an amazing team. Dropping a uninspired game three to Fox. That's that's a little bit more to talk about for T1. We got some problems here. There is a fishy smell coming through the T1 games, and I think a large part of it has to be discovered out from here and figured out and solved before we get to a later part of this summer split is the important thing to look at because you're right. This series, you can look at it and identify in that game three, an incredibly and strangely uninspired performance from T1 to finish out a series where they then don't finish out the series and it finishes with them having their Nexus blown up by Fear X. Absolutely a bit of a head scratcher and one of the ones where I think we have to take a, a bit of a deeper examination into what is exactly going on with T1 and not maybe be blindsided by the EWC victor. So a couple things stand out from this series. Um, obviously T1's read on the meta, gonna be a thing we talk about throughout. Ivern and Tristana just picked all three games. I know we've seen lots of Ivern this split, but it's definitely a one of kind of pocket pick comp specific. I know with double 80 carries everywhere, the extra shields are great, yada, yada, yada. But uh, the, the flip from Tristana performances for Faker, 0-5-0 in the two losses and then somehow gets a 10-0-3 in game two and probably the most bizarre thing from this whole series is seeing T1 absolutely obliterate them in game two so you're ready for that momentum to carry into game three but they show up to the third game like they weren't expecting the next game to have to play. This almost never happens for T1 fans where you do get a happy maybe a tight game maybe you know all these type of things whatever happens if game one into that game two classic bounce back from t1 the regrouping the figuring out all right let's get to that game three and then they drop it in game three and never mind dropping it but looking so uninspired so zero you know, lack, kills zero lackluster in that game three completely that's the problem. And I think when you talk about the Tristana pick with, you know, the Ivern Tristana type of thing going on, I can understand maybe a little bit more of the Ivern, maybe still a little bit questionable trying to, you know, force feed it in as many times here with a specific composition. The Tristana one is more so the, the problem for me because I think this is one of the ones that we see around the world still, still is a premier type of pick. But what has happened in the most recent type of patches that have gone through, yes, you can still hit the big moments, the big games where you're getting, you know, the 10-0-3 Tristana performance of game two, but then you are also more vulnerable to having the performances of game one, of game three, where other teams can find a way to take advantage of that Tristana, to set things up, to then put that behind and let you not be a factor in the game. And that was quite clearly a non-factor for T1 when they were playing the Tristana of game one and that game three, the other factor that was going through for Fear X is the top side, Mr. Clear on the NAR in game three, a mega performance from him. Mega NAR is all over the place, getting it done for Fear X for that third game. Even before that, I think you can look into the first game and what he was able to do for the squad. Getting that win sets up the series clincher of game three. And listen, first and foremost, Fear X absolutely did not play like a two and six squad today. They came uh, full business and maybe their best, probably their best series of the entire split so far. Uh, but now T1, they dropped to five and four. They're tied with Kwang Dong in that four spot. KT is right behind them. I know we've said time and time again, if any team can just flip a switch and turn it on for playoffs, it's absolutely T1. We've seen it time and time again. Doesn't really matter if they're the sixth seed heading into playoffs, but 
I think the biggest thing that this series boils down to, sure, maybe the read on the meta isn't great. Individually, they're not performing. T1's burnt out, man. How can these guys not be burnt out? We're going back to the World Championship where we've talked about multiple times when they had this Red Bull event in December, they did all this press after Worlds. It feels like their entire offseason was a couple of weeks. And then they're going to EWC, going the full distance, right back on the LCK in day one. They have had hardly any break for over a year. I think leading up to the EWC, we had some type of conversations about T1, about the schedule that they had been on the nonstop and how things were going. And combining that with the DDoS issues that were going around with the LCK at the time and specifically targeted towards T1, that we would probably never see the peak version, the world championship version of T1 that we had just come off of seeing the year prior. And then, of course, in the next stretch of a couple of weeks, we did end up seeing more or less that version of T1, the world championship type T1, the EWC champion T1 come through and take that title now we are moving back towards that territory of seeing some of that burnout, seeing the effects that can come through into the gameplay after going through a, st a, st a stressful schedule like that for T1. No mistake, no question in my mind, that is certainly an issue, certainly part of the problem, not the entire problem, but part of the problem that went through today and why the series ends up as a loss. And it's going to be a problem that is only going to get stronger, only going to get worse to deal with as you keep going through at this type of pace, if there is not an intervention, if there's not some type of change up, some type of switch up, some type of break, anything implemented here for these T1 players to find a way to separate and come back in refreshed for that last half of the summer split and playoff run. I'm legit calling Reckless and the boys and saying, listen, let's take a week, two weeks off for the starting five and put the challenger squad in. I don't know what the ruling is around that, but even two weeks like that, it again, it doesn't matter. If they drop every series, T1's going to be there for playoffs. But yeah, there's they're going to be playing through again till October, assuming they qualify for the World Championship, which I think would be absolutely insane if they didn't. So there is no respite. There is no break for them. They absolutely somehow uh, need a refresh of some way because they have just played so many games. It's translated to the Rift. They just look uninspired and burnt out before playoffs are even rolling around in summer. I'll tell you who doesn't look burnt out. That is the best team in the world right now, continuing to shatter records. They contributed to this speed run day of the LCK. 50 minutes they put aside Nong Shim, does Gen G to become the first team ever to have a perfect first round Robin, not just 9 and 0 in series, but a perfect 18 and 0 game score. Nobody has taken a game off of them in summer. Oh, man. The only thing that's going to burn out for Gen G is Rocket Booster number one before Rocket Booster number two kicks in. And we keep going straight to the stratosphere. Holy moly. What a team. What an unbelievable record. This was a wonderful example of it all for Gen G, this series and, and what we had here. I think, unfortunately, you, you have both of the angles of the Maokai brand situation in the uh. jungle to examine here. Uh, Canyon playing both sides of the coin and finding the tough, drawn-out win on the Maokai and then getting the explosive angle going through with the brand in game two. Close things out. I've never seen an Azir look more carefree in his rule as Emperor of the Sands than Chovy in game two while he has this, you know, canyon on brand popping off and he's got Pays making the work happen down in the bottom lane as well. Another game with double digit kills for Pays, another deathless, unbelievably casual deathless series for Chovy. How about both those guys having north of 10? KDAs here in the summer split to be number one and two in the LCK to absolutely no one's surprise. But we go back to spring now. Again, we're not including the EWC. You look specifically at just the LCK, not even MSI. 23 
series in a row. Gen G has won. That's including the spring playoffs. They ended the spring regular season 11 in a row. So 23 total and still got to bring that February 14th, the last time they lost a domestic series. It's just totally wild to, to, to hear those type of things and to know that type of success for this Gen G team. And it brings up the question of the Golden Road, of course, because that is the only squad really on that type of path this year. But if there was ever a squad that was going to make it possible to believe in the Golden Road, it has to be this Gen G team. We've been around throughout all the different iterations. We've seen it when it was supposed to be Longju, or, and then when they became King, King Zone Dragon X, whatever the heck happened there. We've seen G2, we've seen RNG, we've seen it all everyone try their chance at a golden road we mostly recently had jdg get denied their golden road and what an amazing team they were throughout the entirety of the year didn't even come close to their records that we are absolutely smashing and breaking with gen g currently this has to be the golden team for the golden road especially when you're looking ahead to the sweeping changes and you might have three international events in 2025 it's even it's impossible to even imagine a team being able to do that. So it really does feel like this is kind of the last chance for a team to get that elusive title associated with them. But yeah, they look absolutely unbeatable. I mean, we've kind of seen multiple metas now before these 80 carry mids were getting completely out of control. We know Chobi has no shortage of champions he can play. And apparently in solo queue, he's been busting out even Sivir mid, Mark. That's the world we're living in right now. Oh man, we, we have entered into the territory fully of the AD mid. The problems, I think, is kind of the door has swung completely open. Now that the Tristana, you know, situation is more so in okay, she either pops off big time or can be taken advantage of. She's going to get nerfed, options. guys. I promise. Live patch for LCS this week. The nerfs are in. And that is where you're starting to see those Lucians, the Zeris, and heck. Even the dark technology that Chovy's cooking up of the Sivir mid lane and find an angle to go through with it. I'm here for it. I'm here for it. I'm willing to see it and see the experiment come through. All I know is right now, it doesn't matter what experiments are going on in the LCK. It, the experiment's result is a Gen G victory time after time after time. But I will say Golden Roads in the past, the biggest thing that has killed teams, I'm thinking of that RNG 2018 specifically, were meta changes coming into the world championship, the play style that teams had been on an absolute rampage on for the entire year. All of a sudden, there's a game changing either champion item, something in the game that flips, and then it's whoever's quickest to adapt at one specific tournament. Often it's T1 that's able to do that, but that's the only way I see this Gen G squad slowing down. All of a sudden they say, Canyon, you can't play AP junglers anymore. Uh, yeah, either, either something, you know, wacky like that, but we've also still seen through all the way throughout this that Canyon can provide stability and options for this team and other avenues than being that go button on the AP jungler. You look at the top side for Keen and what is the meta of these tank top lane options and what he's able to run through. I don't think we're ever going to run out of an option where that is a possibility, never mind if we start to make these shifts away from it. Well, you have a couple of options that have come through King Sante and now the Skarner as well, which are seemingly immune to the shift away from the tanks because of what they can provide and just how tanky they can still be throughout everything. You go to the bottom lane, Pays has shown that he's more than capable on all the type of things that have run through. Lahens has the creativity that you need. I don't think this is going to be a Gen G that could be caught out by a meta change, meta shift type of situation. Except for, hey, you know, maybe we got to consider that Chovy doesn't gel, doesn't quite pick up Aurora as fast as possible to get her in use for Worlds. Maybe that's the only hope for someone to dis derail the Golden Road. Yeah, I mean, that's the problem is all these players seem incredibly adaptable and have pretty damn diverse champion pools. So ain't nothing slowing Gen G down for the time being. Ain't nothing slowing down this all of a sudden fiery train that is LNG. 
Fresh off of taking down TES to send them to 0-2, they say bring in the only other undefeated squad. They match up against BLG and Scout has leveled up as of late. He says, what is that, 28 games in a row? You've won on the Ari night? The last guy who beat you on that pick? Don't worry. It was me back in 2023 spring, and he breaks the win streak again. How does this happen? How does this happen that it lines up so perfectly that it's this and that it is still another LNG victory added to the board in this new part of the LPL season? And it is wild to think that this is where we are with this one. Yes, LNG taking down BLG. They go the distance, the full three games. And I think we got to start having some conversations, not just about whether LNG is for real with this run and everything that they've done to shed the early season fraud allegations and, and you know, uh, incompetency. But you look at BLG, are we having some questions now about Jun again? Because we went through the whole range of emotions talking about the announcement of Wei, you know, being brought over from RNG. And then we get into some next, you know, the next series or two, you see what is going on from Jun and looks like a relatively strong response. Nothing, nothing out there, you know, good contributions for the team. And it didn't look good today is the problem. And it didn't look good today against Weiwei. And we know Weiwei certainly can bring up his performances, but to say that he has been the peak, the pinnacle of what has been happening in the LPL jungle so far this year, that wouldn't be an accurate statement to go by. So to get beaten by that and to get, you know, kind of cleanly clocked through that throughout this series in those wins that LNG had, that's where you start to question, well, what is Wei here for? When are we going to see Wei? What is the impact that he can bring through to change things up right now? And, uh, you know, absolutely. Wei Wei had a fantastic series. Scout, as we mentioned, won that head-to-head. -head. But I think the less talked about part of this series, when is the last time you saw Elkin on get straight up outplayed in that bot lane matchup? This was an absolute peak vintage gala performance, obviously highlighted by his patented Kaisa in that third game. Felt like, you know, one of those situations where you get those really high-powered magnets that really, you know, repulse against each other, and then all of a sudden they flip, and it's the two sides that connect to each other, and they just smash together. It's so hard. That's how it feels because that bot lane is so good for BLG, but it is so good to see Gala on Kaisa. If they think there's anybody in the LPL where there is more of a pocket pick, one of these ones that you are more comfortable seeing, Gala and Kaisa has got to be very high up on that list for what it is capable of doing and the damage that is possible. Combine that with Scout playing the way that he was leading through this series, making those shot calls. This was certainly the LNG that was the ready to be the challenger to BLG on the day. BLG, they've got to be able to hit a higher level from what we have seen and talked about them, the type of teams that they are in that area of eliteness with. But this was no mistake, a rise up from LNG and a real showcase of what they are capable of this season in the LPL. Oh, yeah, and BLG now, you know, they lost to LGD to close out that first round. LGD's now sitting at 0-3, had a quick exit at EWC, which obviously we're taking with a grain of salt, but definitely not looking so invincible as the BLG that we saw in the spring split, especially, obviously now, LNG, the only undefeated squad in this Ascend group, and just rearing ahead look like legit world's contenders, which is what we were hoping this team would be at the start of the year. And it's not just LNG shedding out of that fraud skin because, well, Weibo sheds it and then puts it back on and then sheds it again, puts it back. Well, lately, they've shed it because they got the 2-0 against anyone's legend. Uh, it was like one, two days ago, we were talking about Tarzan having an abysmal series. Here he is now picking up his league leading eighth player of the game. I have never seen a team and a player look so different on a daily basis. Does anyone else have like a, a jacket or a pair of shoes that you wear and you kind of look at yourself in the mirror and you go, oh yeah, I look, I look good. I like this. I like this. And then maybe like an hour later, you see yourself and you're like, no, what, what am I thinking? This style? No way. It can't be for me. And then you see yourself or you see someone else and they go, yo, sick jacket, you know, nice shoes, whatever. All these stuff. That feels like the up and down that you're going through with Weibo Gaming because you can't decide how to feel, how to ultimately come across it because you're seeing and you're getting it all over the place. 
Most recent one is this win against anyone's legend. And unfortunately, this is the, the double swing of the pendulum because one, you're getting that question. You're getting that answer of, wow, is, is Weibo for real? Do I got to buy into Weibo and understand it type of thing and deal with all the inconsistencies that we have seen so far this year? Or do you look at anyone's legend and do you question what we have seen, what they have built throughout this part of the Fearless Draft, you know, thing of the LPL to now being in this top tier section and not necessarily finding that consistency or getting that ground underneath them quite yet to build upon it. That I think is, is one of the questions that you're coming away with in this series, but overwhelmingly it is the unbelievable and unpredictable nature of Weibo gaming coming through once again. They are the ultimate cryptocurrency of the LPL. <laughs> at their highs, they're at the world finals against T1. At their dips low, they're losing to the worst team in the LPL in convincing fashion. So far and away, the most volatile team in the LPL. But hey, today it's a good day for the boys. Uh, it's not a good day for all the Draven mid mates around the world. I know AD's mid, we're just talking about how crazy it is, but the Draven one did not work out against uh, Jahu's Lucian. No. No, I think that's the one that we can put back. I don't, I don't know if I ever would have really run with that one in the first place. I know that He's we're popping trying. popping barrier level one just doing trades, which I actually respect. I, I get that. But let me tell you that there's something called Lucian. There's something called Zeri existing up in the top side. We have options like Varus and Jin, which I've shown before pretty good comfortable you know natures going into a mid lane going into a solo lane and being able to find success i don't think draven's really ever given us that no matter what level of play you're looking through so it's certainly pushing at the limits to try and test that one it seems like just a, a way bigger risk than anything else because obviously you need the stacks and everyone's trying to kill him he doesn't have a support there bodyguarding him he's so vulnerable in that mid lane and he didn't even have tp this game I think your answer of, of just what the reaction and feeling after playing that performance from Shanks was, was he went on to Corky. Probably the most safe, yeah. most traditional, most okay, everything option in the mid lane compared to rolling the dice on a Draven mid into Shao Hu. I think the other thing important to, to mention in this one for Weibo is Light down in the bottom lane. I think Great that he had series. a very good series and one of these type of ones where you kind of forget about where his power level should be in the LPL and what he has shown us before when Weibo is operating at their very best. Either way, it's a mess in the LPL with Weibo playing like this, LNG's 4-0. I don't know what to be thinking of all the teams over in China, but that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you, beauties.